Hello everyone, I'm Samira Khan and uh, welcome to Happy Hour with Architects. Today we will talk about persistent memory. We have this new byte addressable fast non-volatile memory technology that provides an opportunity to unify both memory and storage. And Intel's Optane DC PMM, it's already in the market, we can use it, uh, we can buy it. And it provides a huge benefit, performance, performance benefit over uh, block storage devices. However, this new type of memory also introduces a significant challenge in how we want to program persistent memory. So today I'm really excited that we have these two pioneers in persistent memory to talk about, um, to talk about this topic with us. And literally they shape the field today that we see. And I'm really excited that uh, we have them with us. Our first guest is Steve Swanson from UCSD, where he leads the non-volatile systems lab. He is the first person to discuss and address software challenges in persistent memory. That's almost a decade ago. And after that, he has been contributing um, with his vision that how the file system support and other system support should work for persistent memory. And essentially that shaped the uh, field. So that's why Steve Swanson today is the perfect guest to talk about this topic. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us. Our other guest today is Andy Rudolph. He is the senior principal engineer at Intel Corporation, focusing on non-volatile memory programming. He is the first person to describe persistent programming model specification, which obviously is now the standard, uh, has become the standard. He started the PMDK team at Intel to develop persistent memory programming kit and which is basically the de facto library that people use with uh, Optane. And his vision and contribution uh, shaped the persistent programming that we know as today. So that's why Andy is the perfect guest to talk about <laughs> persistent memory programming and I'm really excited that uh, he's with us. Um, thank you for joining us. Happy to be here. I'm happy to be here too. <laughs> Thank you. So basically you two started working on this topic when not that many people were looking into it. And whenever someone is pioneering a new thing, uh, it's, it's hard. So sometimes there are, like some people are excited. Some people don't know how to make it out, make it up, make out of it. There might be some resistance on when you, start something. So I would like to start with uh, the Genesis story, like how you became interested in the topic and how was the reaction and how you uh, started. Uh, um, I will start with Steve. Okay. Um, well, I got started, it was maybe, I'd been a professor for like a year and a half maybe, and I was having a conversation with Brad Calder, who was um, was a professor at UCSD and kind of left. And I I I can't say I replaced Brad, but I did succeed Brad. Um, and I was just chatting with him, and he was telling me some of the skinny about UCSD and so forth. And then he also remarked that he th thought that flash memory seemed pretty cool. And I was like, okay. okay. I'll go and look at that. And then that summer I built a little very sketchy um, flash memory testing rig and started doing some little experiments. And then I heard about this, um, this flash memory summit thing. And this was back probably in 2007 or something or 2008 and the flash memory summit was a, now it's a sprawling um, trade show that's huge and fills the convention center. But at the time, it was down the road at a much smaller venue. 
and it was kind of a dark kind of I don't know sparsely attended um, meeting and I showed up there I didn't know anybody and uh, I was staying at a video game themed motel down the road um, and I remember that and then uh, I, I was there and people were talking about phase change memory and Ed Dollar was there, who was a, the CEO or I don't know, CTO or something of Mnemonics, which was the uh, company that did some of the early phase change memory work and Intel eventually bought them. And um, I'm not exactly sure what the path between Mnemonics is and where we are now, but maybe Andy can fill in some of that history. Um, and I just, I, I, I pigeonholed Ed and I asked him for money because that's what young professors do. And I think he gave me $20,000 to like, and I told him I was gonna get phase change memory into, um, into undergraduate curriculum at UCSD, uh, which someday might happen, I guess still. Um, and then that kind of got us started and we started thinking about it. And, you know, flash memory is a big mess, um, you know, with its weird idiosyncrasies and phase change memory and storage class memory and whatever people were calling it then um, seemed much more well behaved and kind of more exciting because it was faster and it was going to be on the memory bus. Uh, and so after we did some work on flash, we started looking at how to build SSDs and uh, kind of programming systems for storage class memory. And that led to the Moneta project, which was this um, really fast uh, SSD that we built. And then built on top of that was a thing called Onyx, which was the kind of first publicly demonstrated phase change memory SSD that we built for, with some kind of very early prototype parts from Micron. Uh, and then also it led to NV heaps, which was the persistent memory, um, main me persistent main memory programming system that we we built. Um, and then from there, after NV heaps, it was it all seemed so remote that it was you know it seemed very far in the future that we were going to actually have this stuff. Uh, and so that line of research kind of got um, put on the shelf for a little while until it became clear that this stuff was actually going to appear, and then. Uh, things got a little bit more exciting. Um, so that's that's kind of how we get to where we, we are today as far as uh, my side. How about you, Andy? Yeah, um, so my background is uh, operating systems and uh, mostly storage and file systems. And uh, I was recruited by Intel almost exactly 10 years ago. I'm coming up on my 10 year anniversary in a few days. And um, I was recruited to work on storage for Intel. Uh, but there was this new technology that Intel had been working on for quite some time before I got there, 3D Crosspoint. And so I don't really uh, actually know the, the details of, of what happened before I got there. But when it became clear uh, about eight years ago that we were going to attach some of this storage to the memory bus, uh, I knew I needed to get smart about this stuff right away. And, started digging into academia and digging up all the papers I could find, which was really only a couple of them. And uh, one of them was the NV Heaps paper, of course, from UCSD. And so, um, you know, everything that I did, it's, it's really standing on the shoulders of giants, as they say, right? I, I, I really used the existing research to um, feed my imagination and figure out, you know, what, what needed to happen to build an ecosystem around this. And, and at the time, I was seeing an ecosystem that had been splintered a little bit in the in the NAND uh, area, where there were different interfaces to different NAND products. Uh, at Flash Memory Summit, for example, you would see different vendors pushing products that had private APIs, where you had to um, um, license their API. And if you were a, an application vendor, then you would have to pick what vendor API to lock into, and that seemed very wrong to me, um, especially since my job was to make sure that there was an ecosystem that we could sell into when we were ready to start selling the, the 3D Crosspoint later branded Optane Media. And so um, by continuing to work with people like Steve and, and, and uh, you know, see the, the research grow, uh, I, 
I was also able to work with the industry leaders as well and try and, and use both sides to sort of uh, uh, help guide us into an ecosystem uh, where there was a unified programming model uh, uh, right shortly after that I read those papers we we formed the work group in SNEA um, which is a standards body and we, we invited all the operating system vendors and a lot of the, the product vendors all the big players in storage and uh, you know that that our, our goal was not not a not a lofty goal it was just having one simple uniform way of exposing persistent memory out of the operating system and uh, I can tell you we read every word that that universities like UCSD wrote about this because it, uh, it was incredibly valuable and so uh, like Steve says that's kind of uh, how these the, these things came together in a confluence to, to lead us to where we are today so when did you two meet and start uh, talking like when that happened <laughs> Hmm. Well, I, I remember that I think I know the answer to this. I think I probably, the first time I remember seeing you, Andy, was at the um, NetApp University Day, where you were right. giving a presentation about the, the early kind of plumbing stuff. And I remember watching your presentation and just thinking, this is the most boring thing <laughs> I've ever seen. Because it was all about like enumerating devices and then and then I realized like, oh wait, this is actually super important because it actually has to work, right? Like, <clears throat> you know, you can't just, um, like what we do, we just, you know, there's some magical device, you know, that we, and one of my graduate students hacks up that we just sort of use, but we need all this stuff to, to, um, to, to enumerate things. And then after I thought about it some more, I was like, well, this is actually good because everything is, he's saying sounds, it's, it's not super exciting. But it all sounds very reasonable, and so, you know, it it, it seemed like we were uh, going to be in pretty good hands. And I think one of the that leads into one of the really exciting things about this stuff is that, you know, I think we'll get to talking about some of the open questions later. But this technology is so wide open in terms of how it should be used. It's as if you know, this is the, the researcher's dream come true because Intel went and built all of this research infrastructure, right? Like we got all the tooling and the libraries and real hardware and like all these things that you just can't get with um, most research projects. And now you can just go buy it and it all just kind of works. Um, so that's really cool. But I think that's when we met and I, I probably talked to you uh, at that meeting. I mean, I don't remember it in particular, but it seems likely. I think you're right about that. Uh, yeah, and you know, back then, uh, we didn't know which use cases were going to be the most important ones. I'm not sure we know today, to be perfectly honest, but we certainly mm -hmm. know uh, now we've been shipping the, the actual product at Intel for, you know, more than a year. So we certainly know how people, which, which use cases are, are people are buying right now for. Um, and and uh, what's funny about it is that it's the persistence. That's the part that everybody wrote papers about. It's the part that's tricky for programming and it's the part where you get the most interesting use cases um, but actually uh, the volatile use of our product has been uh, surprisingly popular so um, as much time as I've put into the persistence around this uh, we've also put quite a bit of time that doesn't get as much airplay around just the ability to use um, the Optane media because it's cheaper than DRAM and big. Yeah. So um, that, that's something that hasn't gotten as much research, I think, um, because it's not as big of a, uh, you know, a disruptive change. But uh, I think there are even still some more use cases out there that we haven't quite discovered yet. So, so I've, I've been curious about this for a while, Andy, like what, I mean, are there surprising things or interesting questions that remain along around the volatile use case? Or is it really, I mean, the story is really simple, right? It just kind of works. And it does just kind of work, but are there, what are the issues that are still there? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, you know, for the Optane media, which is not natively as fast as DRAM, uh, of course, the trick is to decide which data structures have to sit in DRAM and which data structures can sit in this larger, cheaper, but not quite as fast tier. And so the interesting research to be done there is around, uh, can I do that automatically for an application? 
uh, right? The holy grail, I think we'll all agree, the holy grail of persistent memory is to use it with an application that hasn't been modified. Um, and we have a lot of use cases like that, uh, either by uh, having the hardware hide the fact that there's persistent memory, or having the OS hide the fact, or even having some library hide the fact that there's persistent memory. Um, and those things are just uh, dipping a toe in the lake, so to speak. I think there's a lot of interesting research that can be done there um, with uh, uh, some sort of um, uh, layer of software that watches what an application does and makes decisions for it and decides which data structures are really critical to, to go into uh, DRAM and, and, and which don't have to be in DRAM. Um, and so more recently, just to, to, to uh, fully answer the question, if you read the Linux kernel, kernel mailing list, you'll see there is uh, an in-kernel solution that's been uh, posted a few times called memory tiering, which is all about what I'm talking about. How, how do you decide which things go into which tier of memory? And, and it's not just for persistent memory. It, it's not just for mm -hmm. Optane. It's for any layers of different memory with different performance. So I, I think that's actually a very interesting of, of, uh, field of research for us right now. Cool. And what are the other, you mentioned there are other use cases maybe besides the volatile and the non-volatile what are you thinking of there? Well, I think that the, the um, first thing that comes to everyone's mind with persistent memory is that, well, it's, it's persistent, so I should just move my storage onto persistent memory. Um, but of course, that doesn't quite always make sense. Um, persistent memory is, uh, has different qualities than storage. If you think of everything as storage, then you've kind of gone down to the, to the least common denominator of these technologies and what they can do. So uh, I think the, the new emerging use cases are how to do things beyond just treating it as storage. Um, for example, uh, there are several startup companies today that I know of that are working on tiering solutions at, with replication, with other fancy features like uh, snapshots and and uh, uh, other APIs, standard APIs on top of it. So I, I think there's a lot of, uh, in, the, in the practical side of this, the, 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 you know, the business side of this, a lot of people are targeting ways where applications can, can leverage persistent memory um, um, to, to, to solve sort of multiple of their problems, not just performance, uh, not just storage, you know, but also replicating to remote persistent memory or automatically deciding which tier data lives in. Um, that's where I see the, uh, most of the, the um, industry research leading us right now. Hmm. So I have the same question for you, Steve, in, in the oh. academic area. Uh, where do you see the, the research leading us? Um, that's a good question. I mean, I, you know, I, I guess I've, I've been trying to put my money where my mouth is a little bit. I, the stuff that my group is working on is mostly around the programmability problem. Um, I'm, I mean, it seems pretty maybe intractable right now to build for an, a mere mortal to build a, a usable persistent data structure or a reliable persistent data structure. And so finding ways to make that much, much, much easier, I think is a real critical piece. And part of my interest from that comes from uh, some of the things I've heard about where people are using persistent memory, like in desktop applications, like there was that fellow from uh, DreamWorks that came to our workshop last year. And I've talked to some folks at HP who are working on some uh, kind of uh, geophysical data set exploration applications. And they're using persistent memory in workstations and it kind of lets them take applications from being sort of offline to real time as far as exploring large data sets and so forth. And that means, you know, it seems like we need to have a lot more application developers being able to use this memory in a, a flexible kind of very tailored application specific sort of way. And the container libraries are great and there will be those, but people always want to build their own custom data structures and eventually you want to take control away from the STL uh, at some level. Um, another place that I think is interesting is uh, in the mobile space. Um, I think, you know, there's lots of issues around the 
kind of the, the programming model for persistent memory um, in, in the enterprise, because in order for it to really be uh, treated as, as really first class storage, it has to be replicated and you want a lot of data services stuff on top of it. But the, the kind of really compelling idea for me is that you have these, you know, these data structures and you just, as a programmer, you just declare them and then you can just use them. Uh, and that seems like a really natural fit for mobile applications, where I just want to code up some, you know, grocery list app. And it's not a performance thing, but I just want to like sling around some, some containers uh, that store my data and just have those be persistent. And I wake up and open them and then I can really get rid of the boundary between a storage API and a memory API. Um, and the replication and all that stuff just isn't as important because it's just my grocery list or my, you know, my game state or whatever it is. So I think those, um, those are two really uh, kind of compelling directions. Um, and I also think there's, there's potential for optimizing a bunch of, you know, domain specific um, applications. So I have a student right now working on doing uh, mass spectrometry, mass spectrometry uh, spectra querying, right? So they have a huge data sets they want to search for and you'd like to do it in real time. We're trying to figure out how to speed that up with um, non-volatile main memory to build big data sets. So that's where we're working. And there's lots of other, you know, interesting problems uh, as well. I think those are great answers. And, and just to build on that a little bit, the, the, the first one, the programming correctness area, I, I, you know, I look back on my career as how, at how programming tools have changed over time, uh, how uh, memory leaks and things like that used to be, uh, and, and deadlocks used to really be a, a horrible part of our programming, especially in system level programming, complex programming problems. And, but now the tools over time were developed. And I think that's exactly why the kind of research that Steve's talking about is so important that, uh, you know, we, we do have some, some hard problems to solve here. Um, we have tools, but they're pretty rudimentary at this point. They're, they're sort of, you know, the, the equivalent of adding printfs and things like that, that we used to do to try and debug memory problems 20 years ago. Um, and so I, I think that's a very important area. I, I think it's, it has forced a lot of, application vendors to stick to the higher level ideas, the containers, like Steve pointed out, uh, key value stores, just because they know that, that they don't have to, to spend a lot of time developing those. But um, of course it's true, everybody wants to reinvent their own container, they want to do it themselves, and that's where the complexity comes in. So I think that's a very critical area of research for us, and, and exciting too, it's something where, you know, uh, for every new computer language I hear about these days, I, I, it seems like one gets invented every every year or so. Um, I think there are a, a whole class of these problems for for us to go uh, look into. Um, in particular, garbage collection is very oriented towards volatile memory right now. Uh -huh. um, you know, persistent memory garbage collection is a is wide open field. I think right now, and a very interesting field uh, right yeah. now too. So one related question I have here is a lot of focus has uh, gone to programming in C. Uh, what do you think about the other languages and especially like uh, Go-like languages where we can actually push a lot of these uh, checking and uh, maybe allocation at the back and deal with concurrency bugs or persistent memory bugs like where do you see we are going uh, in terms of language? Yeah, I guess I'll start and then I'll let Steve go. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, um, the primary languages that we seem to be focused on in my team are C++ and Java. And uh, we did start out by writing a set of Java containers that are idiomatic Java, they're garbage collected and so on. But, um, we haven't uh, finished making those product quality yet because we got pushed by the ecosystem into lower level libraries. We found that uh, most of the, the large Java apps that wanted to, to use persistent memory wanted more control and they just wanted some basic allocation and uh, transactions and, and that's it. They wanted to make their own containers out of that. So we've been focused on that right now. Uh, but, but in just, you know, uh, just starting that effort in Java and looking at it, I think we've seen 
um, how much work there is to do there. Uh, like I said before, especially any notion of a persistent memory aware garbage collector in a, in a language like Java or Go, both of which are garbage collected. I, I have uh, really no idea how to solve those problems right now. I think, I think we need um, some serious research in those areas to help us along. So Steve, I'll push it over to you to hear yeah. your side. I mean, I think C is terrible. Um, <laughs> so I, I, you know, it's certainly, oh, well, that's actually, well, you know, like lots of people, I have complicated feelings about C, but I think certainly for, for writing um, data structures that have to absolutely be correct and enforce a bunch of very subtle invariants, you know, C is totally the wrong tool. And I think, you know, Java is a little better, C++ is a little better, um, but I think we need much more robust support uh, from the language. And, you know, in the, unfortunately this work never got published, but in the, in the PhD thesis uh, by Joel Coburn, who was a student behind Envy Heaps, we had a sketch for a type system that would enforce a lot of the pointer safety properties that you want in persistent memory. And so, you know, if you can do that stuff statically, um, then you absolutely should. And I've, I've almost come around to thinking that the right solution uh, might be to have a specialized language for developing data structures, persistent data structures, um, that has a lot of these uh, kind of uh, type checking or type-based um, safety checks in it. And then you would link with those into whatever language it is you wanted to, uh, to use them in. Um, and that would be a way to get some, some more stronger guarantees. Um, you know, I'm, I'm interested in the type theory stuff. I'm also interested in, in pushing further to do kind of formal verification of persistent data structures, you know, things designed by contract. And there's been a lot of uh, work and, you know, formal verification of file systems and so forth lately. And finding ways to make that feasible and relatively easy, um, I think would be really uh, valuable. Um, I will also point out that Envy Heaps has a persistent garbage collector in it. Oh, yes. of course. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know if it's any good, but the uh, but there has been some stuff there. But it is it's a really tricky problem. There's also you know I've been having a bunch of email conversations with um, this guy Terrence Kelly who did some of the early library work at HP, um, and we've been talking about the the challenges of persistent locks and how you should uh, should or should not make your locks persistent and so forth. So there's, there's issues there um, to think about as well. But I think we really need some some very different um, very different tools than what we have right now. Like I don't I don't I don't think debugging of persistent memory data structures is really tractable if you want to rely on it for your for your data. Um, and so somehow we have to get away from from having to debug, and that probably means having to uh, to, do, to have the, the computer reason about the correctness of your code in a pretty uh, extensive way. Or have them be first class members of the language, basically. Yeah, and have the language and have the language have the right kind of facilities that you need to, to prove the things that you'd like to prove about them. Um, so that means, you know, more than just integrating the notion of persistence into the language, which would actually is also very valuable. Um, for instance, if you do that, then you can, you know, then the compiler can start reasoning about how to make things go faster, uh, which I think is another interesting, interesting direction that isn't currently possible. Since we just talked about uh, Go, I think it's uh, worth mentioning that at our last Perl conference, which is the Persistent Memory Programming in Real Life conference that that was the brainchild of, of Steve. Um, we had a great talk about uh, 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 Pratop from VMware added support to Go for persistent memory. Um, uh, it's a uh, research at this point, but uh, uh, definitely worth uh, uh, looking at the talk and, and watching the talk to hear about it because it, a lot of the things that we just talked about uh, were uh, discussed in that talk. Yeah, that's a good point.
And as a plug for Pearl, my background is the venue for Pearl. I know. So <laughs> maybe next year, it was going to be this year, but maybe next year, if things are a little bit more back to normal, you can come and join us by the beach and uh, have more yeah, coffee. I think one of those about. dots in the background is me down by the beach when I'm supposed to be attending one of the dots. <laughs> I hope so. No, I can definitely vouch for that. Like the talks were really, really interesting. And it was um, like the excitement in different parts of industry. Like I never thought that DreamWorks, uh, they're, they're interested in persistent memory, right? Like that was a complete new, new news to me. Yeah, that was a great talk by Scotty Miller. Uh, it was one of our keynotes uh, and uh, really, really yeah. fun to watch. Yeah, it was, it was eye-opening. Right, and it just goes to show, right, how how many different kinds of unexpected problems and unexpected solutions uh, companies have and need, and so forth. So I'm curious, Andy, what is the, you know, if we were to look forward, you know, five or ten years, um, what's your dream for what the 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 PMDK and the the rest of the the um, the ecosystem is going to look like? Well, I think uh, I'll give you a, a software and a hardware answer. Uh, software like PMDK, I think, will be infrastructure that most people are not aware of. Um, in a way, that it's, it's that way for a lot of people today. Uh, if you use our persistent memory aware version of Cassandra, uh, your app hasn't changed, you're just calling the Cassandra APIs, and you're thinking, wow, this is fast. But of course, it's fast because somebody converted Cassandra to use PMDK. And, and that's my dream, is that it's, it's mostly middleware layers or, or uh, libraries that other people use that use PMDK to do some of these hard things. But otherwise, uh, the programmer or the end user has no idea PMDK is there. It's just part of the infrastructure. Um, and I think the kind of research that we just talked about, about having tools that help you find problems or languages that help you uh, write correct code. It's a big part of that. That's what makes that kind of thing happen. Um, but I think in the hardware space, uh, of course, I, I could give you the usual speeds and feeds answers. Everything's going to get faster and it's going to get bigger. And, and I think that's very true with persistent memory. I think we, we see a technology with a lot of headroom um, to continue to grow in capacity and, and grow in performance. And um, our ability to to access it, it concurrently while we're accessing other things, just the need keeps growing. So uh, I thought it was really great that we took this persistent memory and crammed it on the memory bus. Uh, but uh, the downside of that is that it's sharing the memory bus with DRAM and they're sharing the bandwidth. So um, I see us in the future um, coming up with more channels to get to, to all this persistent memory or more ways for platforms to share the persistent memory. Um, in, in particular, there's been a lot of activity in the past year around this uh, new interconnect called Compute Express Link. Um, and uh, I've been um, spending the last few months working in a committee in that CXL consortium on all the changes required for persistent memory. Uh, how you, it's all that boring stuff again, Steve. How do, mm -hmm. you, how do you enumerate it? How do you find it? Um, how do you, uh, you know, send it commands and so on? But it's critical uh, for us to build a, an ecosystem that continues to, to be able to attach more and more things to these, to these processors. So yeah, CXL, sounds, CXL sounds really cool. So I'm, is it, this is what I've been asking everyone who knows anything you know, from the inside. Is, is it really going to happen? Um, I, I, what I can tell you is that um, there is certainly a lot of, activity around it from pretty much every major player I can think of. Um, I think on the CXL website, they, they tell you um, how many companies ha have joined the consortium. And mm -hmm. uh, it's up to 100, I think, at this point. And it's every company that you can think of playing in the space of memory or storage. So um, to me, that's indicative that it probably is really going to happen just because people are pouring time and energy into it. Yeah. So yeah, I'm 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 actually very excited about it personally. Yeah, it seems. I mean, it's. I remember when I I saw the first talk I saw about it. It was like, oh, this is the right solution to all these problems, and 
it's gonna, it's not just about the memory too, right? It's gonna really open up all the space for coprocessors and really interesting architectures in a bunch of different dimensions. Um, and it's gonna really let us build all kinds of interesting new systems and interesting new storage devices that I think are gonna you know, continue this blurring of the line between storage and compute and memory. Uh, should be cool. Yeah, I think you're right on there. In, in fact, I think part of what's exciting about these technologies isn't just what the technology itself can do, but what happens when you combine it with the other things. So what, what mm -hmm. happens when we take a device and we put NAND on it and we put 3D Crosspoint on it and mm -hmm. we put CXL and we put, uh, you know, uh, faster networking and so on. Right. As we start combining these technologies together, I, I think it's uh, limited only by our imaginations what we can what we can do with these devices. You had the hardware side, like software side and hardware side. Well, that was the speeds and feeds, right? Everything okay. is going to get faster and okay. Okay. bigger and better and uh, all that stuff. That's exactly right. And, and you know, I, I think um, Steve touched on it, but if you think about people who are building um, accelerators of some sort, um, they typically put some sort of memory on, on an accelerator what happens if that memory is persistent now? Mm -hmm. um, I think we've only really just begun to investigate that kind of thing because first, you know, the first thing we did was just say, oh, persistent memory, let's attach it to a server, plug it into a, a dim slot and see what happens. And, and that was great. But mm -hmm. now there are all these other places you could plug it into, like Steve was saying, uh, mobile devices and, and laptops and accelerators, NICs. Um, uh, you could, uh, of course, build uh, something like a top of rack storage tray that has nothing but persistent memory in it and so on. So I, I think these things, they're, they're, they're kind of limited by um, um, just the time it takes to, to try these things out and do proofs of concept. I think this is where university research again uh, plays a very pivotal role. Um, uh, as Steve knows, uh, uh, we love to just take uh, early versions of this hardware and throw it at universities and say, <laughs> Got any ideas? And of course, the, they always do, right? And, and I think that's a very critical part of evolving the ecosystem too. Yeah, that's been really great. I think another kind of unique aspect of this technology is that the, uh, especially the Intel folks have been so open about the software because you know you guys want to sell the hardware, it seems. And so uh, it's been really nice to have so much visibility into what's going on and. Um, have all that stuff be open sourced. And that's driven, I think, you know, it's been really amazing to watch the explosion in research over the last three or four years as the technology got closer and closer to commercialization. It's gotten much more um, competitive, frankly, you know, all, for a while we sort of had the field almost to ourselves, uh, but now, you know, there's so many great papers coming out, we can, uh, you know, my students and I reading can barely keep up in our seminar and so forth. Yeah, when the MV Heaps paper came out, there must have been one or two other papers that were really about persistent memory at the most. Yeah. And, uh, you know, now it's one or two a month, you know, it's right. really incredible. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's a very different, uh, different world. The reviewers have gotten much more critical. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Since no. they, uh, more of them know what they're talking about, so that's all for the good. So nowadays, um, I do get a pile where most of the papers are on persistent memory. Like that's, yeah. that's a <clears throat> bunch of paper, right? That's a significant number of papers. Even in panels, like one panel on just some persistent memory things. That's also pretty sur was surprising to me. <laughs> yeah that so many people are working on it. And I believe this is just starting. It, it will explode a lot more with time. Yeah, I've, I'm, you know, I, I learned when I was in graduate school that research is kind of fad driven and the fads last about 10 years. And so it's interesting that, you know, since, since they released real hardware, the, uh, we sort of got a reset on the, the fad um, clock, I think, because all of a sudden we have real, real toys to play with. And um, I was actually very glad when the, when, you know, we did this early characterization stuff of the 
of the Optane dims. And I was, I was actually happy that it was as performance was as complicated as it was because if it had just been faster DRAM, then, you know, then a lot of the work had already been done, but there's plenty of interesting behaviors in there for researchers to uh, work out and uh, work around and um, exploit and so forth. And I think, you know, one of the, it's been interesting. I've come to sort of think of those dims as more like SSDs attached via the memory bus um, than like a conventional dim because the, the behavior is, um, it's not quite memory like. And that I think is a really interesting way to start thinking about managing them and it leads to different approaches at the software level and the operating system. Um, and I think that'll dovetail pretty nicely when uh, if CXL comes along, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot more of that, right? It's going to be a memory like interface over a PCI like interconnect talking to something that's kind of in between a DIM and an SSD. So a lot of that work I think will uh, be really useful there as well. So for the Optane uh, specifically, like uh, from the software side, everything is open, right? But uh, on the hardware side, it's kind of a black box to us right now. And as Steve mentioned, uh, a lot is going on there, which we exactly don't know. So that kind of uh, gives, um, like, I'm just curious to know that how things will go in the future. like would we see more and more um, hardware capable? Like there is already a controller doing a bunch of stuff. We can actually do more if we want. Like would we eventually see uh, HBM like stuff where these are all the stacks and then there is a logic layer doing a lot more things. Um, is it um, uh, something interesting? Yeah, and, and I think the answer is certainly yes to all those things, right? Because just like any company, when we have the technology, we start looking for all the different ways we can exploit the value of that technology. So, um, you know, the the fact that it'll get bigger or faster is kind of just obvious because we do that with with every technology. But uh, other ways of of um, uh, combining it with other technologies, I think, is is uh, kind of an open book to us right now. Um, and you know, it like any any big company that has a, a research arm like Intel Labs, um, a lot of what happens in there is done in collaboration with universities, and a lot of what happens in there is uh, you know uh, proprietary IP until we decide to, to what to do with it. And um, so it's hard for me to tell you everything that that's been talked about because <laughs> sure. frankly, we talk about everything, right? We we really do consider everything, but but a lot of it does get driven by, uh, in my experience. Um, these uh, collaborations with universities into trying to decide, you know, where's where is it interesting to go? Um, actually, the the performance work that Steve was talking about was was one of the most useful things that that could have happened for me because we keep so much of this information closely held, um, and it, it comes out in little little snippets of information um, as the uh, NDAs all get lifted when the products start shipping. Uh, I really had a, a great time uh, uh, when I, ever somebody asked me a performance question of just pointing to Steve's paper and saying, you know, that, here, here's somebody independently who went and took the media and figured out what it could do. Um, and, and some of the things in that paper were things that I, we hadn't thought to test or we, we, we simply hadn't gotten around to testing. So, um, you know, I think that's going to happen not just around performance, but around other ways of combining the technologies with, with other ideas. I, I think uh, for all I know, the next big uh, evolutionary step for Optane may come from out of university research, uh, or it might come out of Intel Labs research. I'm not actually sure, to be perfectly honest. So how, do, how closely does, does Intel Labs work with your group on this stuff? Is it a, you guys sit together, or do you just read their papers, or how does... Um, we work very closely. Um, it, it's uh, nobody physically sits together these days. <laughs> so, <laughs> Good um, point. <laughs> it, it's all virtual, um, and uh, you know, especially for me, I'm in a very small site in Colorado. Uh, most of the Intel Labs folks are are uh, that I work with are in Oregon. Uh, 
but uh, we do actually uh, uh, work quite closely together. And uh, it's, a, it's a good question because there's, there's sort of an interesting pattern I've noticed in the 10 years that I've been at Intel. Um, I will go talk to a partner or to a customer and, and I'll learn about a pain point they have, something that, that we can improve on. And I have no idea how to, how to improve on it. So I'll go to Intel Labs and I'll, and I'll discuss that with the researchers there. And in a few cases, uh, that's worked out where uh, we, we sort of germinate an idea together. Um, it uh, takes some time uh, to get especially any sort of hardware idea into silicon. But um, Intel Labs is, is, is the place to start that work because the, these guys uh, you know, are the, the germ of a lot of, of, Intel's, uh, of uh, Intel's ideas. And uh, uh, eventually it reaches some point where, where you know, we're ready to really prove the concept. And, and as often as not, that's where we get the universities uh, involved, where we go back to the partners and get them involved with early samples. And uh, so it's, it's, it's actually very hard to keep a secret in Intel because, because it's so important that uh, what we're doing is driven by these, these customer requirements that we do end up going back and, and, and iterating and talking about it with other researchers and, and other customers again and again. Um, so yeah, I would say it's a very close relationship actually. I'm, I'm actually very happy with that relationship with the labs. What do you hear from your, uh, what's your customer's biggest complaint about Optane memory so far? Yeah, uh, I would say the biggest complaint is that uh, I'm in the data center group, as you know, uh, I work on the server side and um, they're very risk averse uh, in, in the server space. Uh, it took, uh, you know, probably more than a decade for servers to um, use SSDs regularly um, because SSDs were so new for a while and they, they didn't want to introduce risk into their into their platforms. So, uh, I, you know, initially I thought, my goodness, is it going to take us a decade to convince uh, people to, to, to trust in persistent memory? Uh, the good news is, um, for whatever reason, uh, we're actually seeing the, the adoption of persistent memory go a lot faster than the adoption of SSDs went. Uh, maybe it's because the people have already been through this kind of disruptive storage technology change once, and now it's not so surprising that it's happening again. But it, it is still a pain point, and it's, it's everything that we talked about. Um, you know, uh, show me some data that shows me I can trust this. How do I know that uh, the changes are correct that we're making to programs and things like that? So, so those are the, the, the very pain points that we talked about earlier about the need for uh, tools or more, um, more libraries that are very solid and very uh, trustworthy in, in, a, in a wide variety of languages or more transparent solutions, solutions that are uh, you know, transparent to the application. Um, we certainly are, are coming up with a wide variety of those um, and, and in a way, that doesn't help because that gives you so many choices that, you know, I, I can go to somebody and say, well, here's a transparent way of using persistent memory. Here's a non-transparent way. Oh, and I forgot about this other transparent way. Oh, and I forgot about this other non-transparent way. And pretty soon their eyes glaze over and they're saying, well, that's, that's too much. And, and so we, we really have to rein that in and, and focus on each use case and what its needs are. So uh, it was a long answer, but I, I, I think the, the short version of that is, uh, complexity and, and your ability to trust a new technology is, is, is one of the key pain points. I would like to actually talk about uh, one specific thing that I had in mind. The, uh, like let's, let's, for example, let's take uh, transactions or uh, logging, right? Sure. And then we have the, the um, redo or undo logging at the PMDK library. But then there are like 20 uh, proposals for hardware logging or hardware transactions. Uh, right. You talked about garbage collection. Um, personally, I think that it should be done in the software, but then uh, there are a bunch of work and uh, a lot of people think that if the memory already has controller and doing a lot of stuff, maybe it would be better in doing that type of uh, activities. 
So where do you think these boundary lies between software versus hardware? Like? Do you want to start on that one, Steve? Sure. Um, you know, I think, uh, I think everything that can possibly be done in software should be done in software. Um, I think, and in particular on this, you know, there's, we, we, we've been through the transactional memory fad that ended, I don't know, five or 10 or 15 years ago or, or whatever it was. And, you know, the, the hardware solutions, and it's not clear that any of it went much of anywhere, but the only hardware solutions that survived are, are things like Intel, where you have a, a very small kind of simple primitive um, that does just a very tiny little bit to make make things a lot faster, and I think that's probably the right the right model. Um, the f there's just so little flexibility once something is baked in, and especially in the research community, and especially in the architecture community, there is a tendency to just you know I'm writing an ISCA paper, so I will implement, I will say that my idea is implemented in hardware, um, without any sort of you know careful or a thoughtful uh, concern about, you know, how ridiculously complicated it's going to be. Um, and so I, I think you just really have to, to pay very close attention to that. And when we've, when we were building uh, Moneta, which was this early um, SSD that we built, you know, a good way to, to keep yourself on the right side of this is to like design stuff in FPGA, because then you actually have to pay the pain of implementing something in hardware and it makes you think very carefully about what you could actually get by with um, in software. And you can actually, I think, get by often with very, very little hardware support. And you can get a lot of leverage out of that if it's designed uh, in the right way. Um, so I don't have a lot of a lot of confidence in a lot of the hardware persistent memory logging um, papers that I um, that I see come around. Um, and then, you know, in addition, the, you know, there is this controller, which I guess seems to be quite complicated. Um, it's on the dim, but you know, those, those controllers are distributed across the memory controllers and there's not an interconnect among those, uh, controllers. And so having them enforce interesting properties like ordering, which is inherently global seems hard. Um, we just wrote a paper the other day in a, one of our seminars that you know, had some interesting thoughts about that, but um, it, it's it's not a great place to be embedding uh, computation, um, or at least uh, kind of the kind of semantic computation that you're trying to do with uh, transactions. So, uh, and I guess the other the other cautionary tale, right, is when garbage collection first came out, there was this call for we need we need garbage collection hardware, right, because it's so slow. Um, but really, you just needed to give the software folks, you know, five or 10 years to figure it out. And they made it go fast um, by kind of carefully optimizing things. And I think the same thing will happen um, with persistent memory. And it's so early, right? Like, what a terrible time to start making stuff into hardware. And hardware is forever, right? I mean, the hardware is not, but the, the ISA is. And once you, you know, once you commit to Intel supporting or whoever supporting a particular model or set of semantics, that's going to be in the hardware forever, right? Because you can't remove it because then, you know, you'll lose market share or whatever. Um, so I, I think hardware support should be used in very small sparing quantities. I think that's a great answer. I think our hardware guys would completely agree with you. <laughs> uh, or, or, or maybe to say it another way that uh, instead of saying everything that can be done in software should be done in software, I would say that everything that can be done will will happen first in software anyway, right? Yeah. Because it, it does it takes it a long time to 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 make it into hardware, and it's like you say, uh, if it's wrong, uh, either a you've wasted a lot of time and money, or b you end up supporting something you don't want to support for a long time. And uh, I, I think uh, you know anyone who paid attention to the full uh, story of persistent memory emerging from Intel knows that we initially had another instruction called PCOMIT uh, that uh, was an, kind of another layer of confusion for programmers to use. It was a, a little hard to describe. It was a little puzzling. And um, 
at the last minute, uh, basically, we were able to uh, get rid of the need for that instruction by convincing every platform to, to flush uh, the memory buffers uh, automatically on a power failure. And, uh, you know, I, it was mostly a, a few of us who kind of led the charge around getting rid of pcommit, saying, we need to do this now or we're going to support this instruction mm -hmm. forever. And I'm, I'm actually, it's one of my uh, moments that I'm quite proud of that we, <laughs> we prevented us from having to support something for, for that long when, when we were able to design it out of the platform by working with uh, uh, OEMs. So, yeah, it, I think these things happen in software first. Um, I actually have a long wish list of things that I'd like to see in hardware. And uh, I talk to the, to the labs guys and to the CPU guys about it a lot. And, uh, and we spend a lot of time weighing the pros and the cons, the costs and the benefits. And, you know, only when I can sort of really prove that there's a benefit to a hardware implementation do they, uh, do they really start to perk up and, and start thinking about how to, to design it into hardware, which is as it should be. I, I think it, it should be a very high bar to change something from software to hardware. I agree. And I think it, the, inter, the interface that we have currently, it's, it's so minimal and clean. Uh, people, I don't think people appreciate it. Like it's just two instructions. And then it's enabling a whole lot of things by just using those two instructions. Clean is good. And around Intel, I'm 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 known as the the guy who who you know keeps the programming model the same across all these generations. Um, it doesn't really happen much anymore. But in the beginning, when persistent memory was new, uh, ideas would come up, and you know, not to say they're bad ideas, but we don't want to just keep changing the programming model with each generation, right? It's very important that these programming models survive, not just across Intel products, but I think across the ecosystem, across different uh, processor vendors, across different uh, um, persistent memory vendors and so on. So I'm the protector of the programming model. Uh, mm -hmm. That's how I'm known around Intel. I mean, really the, the hardware interface would be twice as good if it only had one instruction, right? That's exactly right. Instead of two. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> so last question. So when, like, let, if I take 2010 and 2020, in terms of how things change or how momentum we gained, it's actually huge, right? So if you think about 2030, uh, what do you expect? Like, what, or what would be the dream case for you in terms of persistent memory? Boy, that's hard for me because that's that's far enough out that I, I'm not sure that I'm I'm thinking that big just yet. I've I've been you know really concentrating on the execution of persistent memory. I think it, by by 2030, I hope that uh, it's some technology we haven't thought up yet, or or that we haven't you know dreamt of yet. Maybe something that replaces uh, you know the volatile memory in the systems completely, or uh, replaces the interconnect between systems with something so fast that racks full of systems are treated like one computer or, or something, you know, something big and disruptive. And I, I'm not quite sure what to answer there, but I, I bet Steve has some good answers since it's <laughs> forward thinking. I mean, I think it's an interesting exercise. Um, and, and the ability to do it as a sign of, of my advancing age, right, is that I actually remember 10 years ago with some clarity from a technical perspective. It's interesting both how much stuff has changed and also how slow progress is. Um, and so, you know, some things have changed a lot, like persistent memory is here, which is a huge change. Um, but at the same time, like a lot of the concepts that go into the programming models, like, you know, a lot of that stuff was in Envy Heaps. A lot of that stuff was in uh, Rio Vista, which came, you know, seven years prior or something like that. And, and so a lot of that stuff is actually very, uh, is very consistent across long periods of time. I think what I would like to see in, there's at least in, uh, I like to see it is, is a much more fluid line between storage and memory kind of in the way that people program. And so I could imagine that we would have some languages, maybe mainstream languages, maybe novel languages, um, where you really can just say, you know, I want this data structure to be persistent, and that will be a very natural act, 
right? It won't be a, an interesting uh, decision to make um, for a programmer to just say, I want this to be persistent and then it'll just, just kind of happen and it'll, you'll have confidence that it will work and it won't be a uh, cause for anxiety. Um, I think there'll be, hopefully, you know, this memory will be in more places doing a wider variety of things. Um, and that means that we'll see it in, in many more kinds of programs. It'll be used in lots of interesting and exciting ways. Um, and I think, you know, the, the stuff that Andy mentioned about things like system deaggregation and, um, you know, very sophisticated and powerful mechanisms for sharing data across the network uh, between persistent memory and other kinds of memories. I think that seems uh, like it's coming pretty quickly. Um, and also the, the stuff that we were talking about earlier with thinking about the relationship between different kinds of coprocessors with different kinds of memory technologies, I think will also be a very prominent um, part of computer system design. Right, because processor performance is not scaling, so you know the march towards accelerators is going to continue, and the march towards memory heterogeneity is going to continue. Um, there's going to be more of that. DRAM has problems uh, scaling wise, so that's all going to start changing, and stuff is going to become a lot more complicated. And then the 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 question is, how does the software go and deal with all that complexity? And you know, and in, in some ways I think the persistent memory piece is sort of the the first uh, the first kind of wedge um, into the system right where this the uh, the operating system is having to think about more different kinds of memory and managing those and reasoning about them and optimizing for them and a lot of that same thinking and infrastructure is going to get repurposed as memory begins to be different in different ways um, and be interspersed with different kinds of coprocessors and things. So that's where I, I imagine that we'll end up. I don't know if I hope we end up there. It sounds like a very complicated world, um, but it does seem like where we're going. And so there'll be lots of research to be done. So that's good uh, for me anyway. Yes, exciting times. <laughs> yeah. It will be exciting to see all these things happening. <laughs> Uh, with that note, uh, I think we will uh, finish here and thank you so much. I really enjoyed the discussion. Uh, thank you for your time. Yeah, thank, thank you. you, Samira. This is a great idea. All right. Oh, thank you.